questions are, where are we today in ground transportation in Hawaii? Where do we want to be in 2045 and how do we get there? And what do we need to do in the next several years in order to move towards that vision? We'll have the panelists engage with each other and the moderator on key similarities and differences in their views and seek common ground on what next steps are important to shape ground transportation policy in the near term. So I'd like to welcome our uh, panelists. We have uh, Robin Shishido from Department of Transportation, Ben Sullivan from County of Kauai, Dave Rowe from, from Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association, Aki, Aki Marceau from Elemental Accelerator, and Kathleen Rooney from Ulupono Initiative. And moderating the discussion is Amy Ford Wagner from the Federal Highway Administration. Welcome all. So first speaking is Robin Shishido from uh, Hawaii Department of Transportation. Okay, so you know here at the DOT, you know, we know that we need to do something now. You know, um, anyone lived in Hawaii or been here in the last two years, and you've seen the impacts that we've been having to our roadway infrastructure system. Uh, looking at some of these photos, stopping, starting at the top left corner, um, last uh, February or so, we had that storm with the winter event and on one of the Ilani Highway. After the wind uh, went through, we had a lot of rock fall. Um, next photo, also on Honapilani Highway, you know, we'd see level rise and a lot of shoreline erosion. You know, we have ongoing issues on that roadway. Uh, coming down here to the bottom right side was a poly tunnel. Everyone's probably familiar with whoever lived on Oahu. And uh, you know, looking at the bottom left corner is a uh, slide of uh, tropical, uh, tropical storms that have come through our uh, area. I think that was from 2018. And we're just seeing a lot more of these events and a lot more frequently and more impactful. Um, some other events that happened, uh, Kauai Island, you know, on the upper left is when we had that uh, record rainfall that came through in 27, uh, 2018 as well. And on the bottom right is uh, what resulted after that, you know, stabilizing the slope. Uh, the pictures on the upper right and the bottom left is uh, West Maui along our bypass road. Uh, this was right before Hurricane Lane and, you know, at the DOT, we were preparing for a hurricane coming through, and through all that, we ended up with a big, massive fire. You know, with all the drying conditions, it was just uh, had a lot of fuel for fires to come through. Um, lastly, you now looking at sea level rise, uh, this is, I believe, on Camp 5, Kamehameha 5 Highway. Um, the black line is the existing road, the blue line is um, where the existing shoreline is, and the colored areas is where the sea level rise and what is going to be impacted. So, you know, we recently did a study report that had, um, I think, about 20 priority locations for us. So, you know, we're, we're going through and addressing those. Uh, when we look at transportation uh, from a sustainability standpoint, I mean, it's more than just reducing our fossil fuels. Uh, looking at our energy consumption through our energy savings contract, performance contract, you know, we converted a lot of our lights, lighting systems to LED lights. Uh, looking at vehicle standards, you know, we're looking at fleet conversion from our fossil fuel or ICE vehicles going to electric vehicles. We recently put out a RFP to request proposals for uh, charging or um, electric vehicles and charging infrastructure as a service. Um, that should be opening up here in the next few weeks. Um, we're looking at green construction. You know, we have different things they're doing like a carbon uh, injected concrete, you know, to reduce our overall carbon footprint within, you know, the islands. Um, research, you know, we're also looking at other technologies which we can further help, you know, reduce our carbon footprint. And, you know, with interagency coordination, just, uh, you know, looking at, talking with other agencies, you know, when we look at realigning our roads or, you know, any other land use uh, planning and, you know, which roads we can look to, to further uh, move inland. And so, with that, I mean, that's uh, kind of where DOT, you know, what, what we're facing right now, what we're going, what we're trying to do, reduce our carbon footprint. You know, here's uh, our Oahu district where we recently purchased electric vehicles and installed some uh, chargers. So I think that's about all I had. Um, well, I guess, you know, so looking at all those photos, you know, it looks like a real gloomy picture, but hopefully with all these changes we're making, you know, we're going to be headed in the right direction. Amazing, a minute under time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get that minute? <laughs> Okay, and now we've got Ben Sullivan from County of Kauai. <coughs> okay, so uh, my name is Ben Sullivan. I'm the Energy and Sustainability Coordinator on the County of Kauai. Um, I work for Mayor Derek Kawakami. A lot of you legislators out here know him as the former state rep. Uh, I really enjoy what we're doing over there. Giving a little context, again, we are talking about climate change and we have been hit by quite a bit over there. Things are, uh, there's too much water, there's, too, there's not enough water, there's 
Uh, too much water again in terms of sea level rise, and then there's things that are just out of place with that buffalo. Um, so that, that's what we face, right? That's the future. Um, the picture on the top there is, is me kind of road parking my bicycle wherever I can, and that happens all over town. That happens to be at the brewery, uh, just a coincidence. Um, how does this work here, Robin? You got me? Oh, just press Which one? This one? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, where are we at today with transportation? We, um, we got a hammer and everything's a nail. Every, every single problem we've solved for decades and decades and decades with transportation is a car solution. And so really this is about mode shift as, as we see it. Um, the, the, the solutions we have now have created a lot of inequity across our communities. Um, we have limited choice as far as how we get around other than cars. Um, people have to pay for expensive cars, they have to drive far, they have to sit in traffic. That has created widespread health issues that we're all well aware of. We have reduced community cohesion, we have traffic and, and capacity backlogs that we can't possibly catch up with, and Robin knows very well about that. Um, and we have large and growing GHG emissions. So that, that chart right there is just showing Kauai emissions, and, and, and you see about a third of it from uh, cars and trucks. This is where we want to be. The good news, see that was blue, which was bad news. This is green, which is good news. The, the, the good news is that we get all these benefits if we change. So if we actually really mode shift, if we really go for this, you know, we get more equitable choices in our transportation. People that aren't making enough because they're working in the service industry can ride a bus and they can still afford to pay their rent and they can still afford to choose good, healthy food. We can, we can give choices in terms of diversity. I know that there was conversations about an e-scooter bill this year, which I think would be great. Last year it was an e-bike bill that really made a big difference in terms of enabling electric bicycles. We get more healthy residents and the Department of Health is doing a tremendous job already really connecting the built environment and the importance of the built environment on people's health. We get connected communities. Um, City and County uh, Climate Change Office identified connected communities as a key, key resilience strategy. So there's another benefit we get by getting people out of their cars as much as possible. And not, not to eliminate cars, just to say that cars can play a role and so can other modes. Uh, we get functioning systems. You know, If we keep going on the trajectory we're on with cars and growth, we will be stuck in traffic, period. If we stop, we can actually go forward and not add need not not expand the need for capacity on our roadways we just basically offset almost like we're doing in energy efficiency we offset all future load growth with, with shift in modes last thing we can zero out GHG emissions and Dave is going to give some points on how challenging that will be and I'm eager to hear those points um, how am I doing two minutes. two minutes wow okay so how do we transform ground transportation we got to put equity first, and this is a conversation that I think a lot of us have been really, a lot of people have been helping me understand better. Um, really, some smart people out there advocating and telling us, hey, look, you know, we're going to try to solve these problems. These are universal problems, but why don't we start by putting resources in a place where it'll help people the most? So we, you know, the example I was talking about today a lot is if we're given EVSE incentives, EV charger incentives. Let's not give them to the folks in Kakaako buying $1.5 million apartments. Let's give them to teachers that maybe need charging at their schools, or let's give them to the communities who are barely affording their rent so that they can actually charge vehicles and save money on maintenance and fuel. Um, improving data systems, critical, right? We don't know how people are really moving around. We don't know who is moving around and where they're going. We have basically the tube counters, and there's a lot of technology out there that can take us a long way forward in terms of data collection, but we need to work together. And what I've seen on a limited basis on Kauai is that we're kind of working on our own solutions and not really thinking about this as a systems problem. Uh, we need to lead by example. So as a, as a county, our state employees still can't rent an electric vehicle when you go to rent a vehicle, which is completely crazy because it's our policy that we want to be 100% clean by 2045, yet our employees can't actually participate in that. But that can change, and I've heard some smart legislators thinking about working on that. Uh, increased development density. We all know about this. Land use is one of the big issues. Scott mentioned that. Thanks, Scott. We're working on it. Um, this actually is a project, the Lihui Tiger Grant, which is the town core revitalization, and it's really looking at how do we, how do we make this better. Last thing is engage community um, to build and support change. This came up in, I think, the first panel. So we're doing that in a lot of ways. There's somebody building an electric um, Alfa Romeo Spider at the community college. This is our utility cooperative who is a huge success story in terms of what they've done with, with renewable energy. Um, we're hoping that they're gonna jump into the game on, on, on ground transportation and they're already showing signs that they're doing that. Um, this is Kauai Level Plus Challenge. Check it out at kauaichallenge.org. This is actually something that's gonna come statewide and it's how we engage households in this solution. Thank you. Now, thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo.
Thanks, man. It's been a joy working with you, by the way, and everybody uh, on the panel here. Uh, and he taught me the big shaka. I just learned that today after 45 years of living here. I, I work with the auto dealers, uh, and uh, I'm David Rolfe, the executive director of the, uh, of the New Car Dealers Association. I have an electric car, and many of the dealers have electric cars, too. And I see Mitch out here, too, if, uh, with the hydrogen. We've been working with hydrogen, and now you're, you have hydrogen as electric cars as of this year, and that took four years to pass, but it's now there and happening. And I was hoping they would answer that question about, are we gonna extend those benefits uh, you know, for electric cars now? But I'll, let me jump into this by showing you what the world would look like uh, in 2045 or beyond that, actually, with 100% renewable fuel. And I was glad the governor was here because his executive, executive order 017 is what launched the Penn State students into doing a big study of what autonomous vehicle cars would look like in combination with the Honolulu Rail. And since AVs have so much in common with EVs, I thought I'd start off by showing you what the dream looks like. Here is a pocket of autonomous vehicles in a Waipahu, and it's all built around the rail station. And so what these students did was they saw on the internet the governor's executive order, 017, saying we're open for business for uh, uh, the development of the autonomous vehicle, which, by the way, said many will be electric vehicles. So we dealers uh, joined with the University of Hawaii uh, Department of Engineering and created the Hawaii Autonomous Vehicle Institute with the idea of helping us move forward on these renewable energy goals. Well, lo and behold, the students in Penn State envisioned the whole thing and started drawing pictures of it. So this is uh, what it looks like with 100% renewable fuel. And the cars are parked outside this zone and they actually sit in these vertical parking garages and you can have your car kind of come to you, pick you up, and then of course you can go over to the rail station and you can go wherever you want and then it goes back into its vertical parking area. We asked the good people at uh, Deloitte after they gave us this incredible graphic uh, if we had permission to show it. And sure enough, here are suburbs with the blue houses there uh, on the uh, left-hand side. Your car uh, takes you to the rail station you hop aboard, go off to your work, uh, come back, uh, and the car goes back to your garage uh, in your house, and then it, it uh, comes back to pick you up when you get home. So uh, I know I'm talking a little bit about autonomous vehicles. It's because that's where we feel is the way to kind of get toward some of these goals, because I'm going to show you the heavy lift that we have to do. We have to have a lot of different ideas. Uh, what happened, by the way, we were putting together this idea of autonomous vehicle pockets, and lo and behold, out came this gigantic thing from Japan this week, and I don't know if you saw it in the news, but it's called the Woven City. And uh, the good folks at Toyota are creating a giant city uh, uh, that is all autonomous vehicles and uh, artificial intelligence and uh, all sorts of robotics, uh, and it will be this idyllic city uh, in Mount Fuji, right below Mount Fuji, that um, is this as big as Silicon Valley, and they're going to kind of test all this stuff going forward. Well, that it was exactly what the Penn State students had envisioned as these autonomous vehicle pockets that we as an auto dealer association embraced and start going forward to see if we could get us to this great goal that we all kind of looked at together. So here's where we are now. So we have about 10,000 vehicles on the roadway in Hawaii. Uh, the dealers have all brought those in, they paid for them, they had to buy them first, and it's uh, $400,000 I think they put up already for that. We said there would be 10,000 on the roadways in Hawaii by 2020. There's almost 10,000 on the roadways by 2020. Uh, when we were participating in the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, we said there'd be about 50,000 by 2030. It's all on track to do that. Uh, and we said, uh, here's what it's on track to do, the way we're headed now, and that's to have 29.3% uh, of the cars on the roadway uh, by 2045. That's 293,000 vehicles that would be electric. The rest of them, as you'll see in the year-by-year -year graphic there, are hybrid electric vehicles uh, and uh, gasoline vehicles and hydrogen vehicles and all sorts of other things. So there's quite a heavy lift to take this uh, big graphic here, which shows how many cars will be on the roadway, because we sell 50,000 new cars a year, and uh, over a 20-year period, that's a million. So here's what it would look like if you had to transition to get to all those million cars to be electric. Come 2025, you would have to start selling every car that we have in our, on our lot and in our showroom would have to be electric or hydrogen. And you'd have to see this giant bar above, all those bars above the red line would have to have charging stations or when we talked to the hydrogen people, we said, could you put in that many much hydrogen infrastructure in the next 20 years? Even when we talked to the electric folks, we said, will you be able to cover all those cars in the, in the next 20 years after 2025? And everybody kind of scratches their head. And that's why we started looking at things like the AV pockets, 
all these other concepts because we know that free market enterprise but with people coming to Hawaii as we're, we're open for business well, that can help us get there you just can't mandate that everybody buys an electric car starting in 2025 to hit them uh, I don't know whether we could get the cars either so cars are connected to everything and I appreciate it being connected to you because it's been wonderful working on all this together with everybody we call it a pure joy and we say we can move a mathematical uh, proof of pure joy because it's so hard to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate being connected to you too, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm Aki Marceau. I'm the Managing Director of Policy and Community for Elemental Accelerator. And we're a nonprofit organization and we actually just moved from Bishop Street to Alakea Street. We're in a Lee place now. So um, over the next few months, I look forward to seeing you folks kind of pop into our office. It's Great to see so many friendly faces in the audience. And, um, you know, I've, I've been thinking kind of at the beginning of this year what 2020 really means. Um, who, who does New Year's resolutions? Can you raise your hands? Okay, yeah. So um, I don't do a resolution per se, but I set an intention. So I have a word that I say to myself. And this year, and Amy actually mentioned this in her conversation, but this year my word is courage or courageous. And when I think of 2020, you know, remember back to Y2K? That felt like a really scary time in our lives, right? So 2020 seems a lot scarier to me. Um, and that's because this is the decisive decade for climate change. And this is, you know, essentially going to show whether or not we, we can live on and inhabit and kind of thrive on this earth and on this planet um, for generations to come. Um, and so... Um, when, when I'm thinking about transportation, you know, when I talk about courage, um, there's always this intersectional aspect to it. So a lot of you folks are familiar with the graph on the, the left, um, which, is, which shows how much we have to, you know, we have to peak our emissions globally within the next five years or so, and then we have to rapidly decarbonize as fast as we can within the next 15 to 20 years. So that's some scary stuff. I think we can do it. I mean, we have to do it. We don't really have a choice. But that's kind of, you know, as, as Scott mentioned in his comments, Transportation is one of the biggest leaders in, in causing climate change right now. So, but meanwhile, kind of on the day-to-day -day basis, there's something that we can't really af avoid, and I think folks at HDOT, in the auto industry, um, just anyone who is on streets ever thinks about, and that's, uh, that's around safety. And so, um, you probably all remember that really tragic accident that happened on Kamake'e and Alamoana Boulevard last year. And it actually like makes me kind of emotional to think about. Um, but that I would like to say that that you know having three pedestrians die because of a drunk driver um, in the middle of the day is an unusual circumstance. But actually, this is a screenshot from the Star Advertiser um, from January 3rd, and so it goes to show that you could actually probably say that um, pe people are seriously injured or killed by cars every single day in the state, and that can't be avoided. You know, I mean. The climate change doesn't make our, the issues that already exist kind of disappear, it actually exacerbates them all. And so I want you, you folks to kind of think about, um, think about that challenge that we have. So you'd think we'd mobilize around the safety issue, you know, you'd think we'd, be, we'd try and transition to um, multimodal transportation, really rally around uh, transit-oriented development, different modes of transportation, um, walking, biking, that type of thing. But the reality is, um, and you can tell me if I'm, <laughs> tell me what the, the facts are, but um, that we're, we're buying more Toyota Tacomas. Right? Right? And there's nothing, you know, necessarily wrong with buying a Toyota Tacoma. That's kind of what we're taught to buy. Um, do you guys, have you seen that little bit on YouTube with Joe Coy <laughs> with the Toyota Tacomas? Check it out. It's really funny. Um, but but that's, that's kind of the state at which we are right now. And so we're, we're buying, we're, we're in this um, transportation arms race right now where we're buying bigger and bigger vehicles with the illusion that those vehicles are making us safer and safer. safer. And the fact of the matter is, is that they're not. So on the EV, so there's that safety side. On the EV and decarbonization front, um, this is data that um, we collected uh, three years ago from when we published Transcending Oil. And it showed we have these really ambitious goals of zero emission vehicle by 2045, 100%. And I think those goals really make a lot of sense within the state of our climate crisis. We shouldn't shy away from them. Actually, we should lean into them. But what, that, what this shows is that in order to get there, we actually have to, as they've mentioned, really limit the sale of um, internal combustion engines, 
within the next 10 years, very drastically. And I think the good news is, is that we are getting there. We're selling a number of EVs right now. We hit the 10,000 um, vehicle mark this year. But I was a little disappointed. There was recently a Star Advertiser editorial that came out that said that, you know, oh, we hit that, that, we've hit the tipping point. You know, let's just stop there. You know, we have some, um, some fees and registration. Let's just stop there. We actually need to start leaning into this more and more, and we cannot back away from electric vehicles and zero emissions vehicles because we have, we have a lot of work to do for us to meet our 2045 goals and for us to decarbonize the transportation sector. So from the elemental accelerators perspective, we've um, done a lot of, had a lot of conversations with you folks, with a lot of different um, players in the transportation space and kind of around that so concentric circle outside of the transportation space. And the things that we're gonna really lean into uh, in the next year are putting more butts in seats, um, mode sh increasing mode shift, making electrification easier, that was talked about quite a bit, decarbonizing freight and aviation, and supporting transportation in rural communities. And we think that last piece is really important because commute times are actually one of the um, things that can take people out of, out of poverty. Um, and, and in this next legislative session, I think Scott presented a really great overview of, of the funding for the State Energy Office and all of the um, capacities that they have, but we need to start to reallocate more funding into the State Energy Office so they can do things like um, support innovative measures that I think a lot of folks have already mentioned today, um, but also be able to, in to implement and um, activate the community to make sure that people aren't left behind in this really rapid transition that's gonna happen within the next 10 years. Thank you. All right, Katie, I know you'll bring us home. Yes. Katie Lee from the Ula Photo Initiative. Oh. As soon as we find me. So I, I'll just start, because I know what the first slide is or two. Um, and. My name is Kathleen Rooney. I'm the Director of Transportation at Olupono Initiative, and we are a Hawaii-based uh, impact investment firm where we make nonprofit and for-profit investments in, let's say, clean transportation, renewable energy, local food production, and better managing our waste and water. And within the, renewal, the clean transportation space, we've made all different types of investments over the past few years, um, helping launch Beaky, um, doing work on the Autonomous Vehicle Task Force with Dave here and a few others in the audience, and really just trying to continue to invest in these types of things that help us get towards <coughs> Hawaii's self-sufficiency, particularly as it pertains to fuel imports and emissions. And so where are we going? This is actually from the 2016 GHG emissions, and you can see here is that basically we're hanging out at the same space in transportation and have been now for 20 years. Everybody's kind of getting better, more efficient, doing more. We're not that different. The top one is the total emissions, so you can see how that's gone over for the past 20 years. And then on the bottom is the transportation numbers and how they break down. And I think it looks green, hopefully, to everybody, because it does to me. Um, you know, Grand Transportation is there, and it's a big part. And I think Scott really underlined how this one is one of the big things that we really need to grapple with. So that's where we're at. Um, and then where do we go? I think, you know, there's been a lot of commitments. Um, in terms of where we need to go in ground transportation and you know it's 100% renewable energy across all the counties and I think that's a pretty excellent goal and how do we get there so with some points from Aki's organization's transcending oil report we really need to you know continue to shift the state land use and transportation modes away from auto modality we've seen a lot of good things happening in sort of downtown redevelopment areas but that needs to be a wholesale shift we need to price the full cost, of pri pri full cost of parking and driving for users. It's just people do not actually know how much it costs to provide all of these things that support driving. We need to design public streets uh, for moving people, not vehicles. Right now, we care how fast your car gets there. We don't actually care what you where you're going, how you need to get there, all of those types of things as part of our analysis. Um, and that really does need to shift. We need to think about how to move as many people through some of these really congested corridors, not just the cars they're in. Um, we need to stop inducing demand, um, which some folks may not be as familiar with this topic, although I see some people definitely nodding their heads. But 
for every 10% increase in lane miles that we develop, um, we basically see an, another 9% increase in BMT, which means people just, when we build more roads, we build more driving. Um, and we really need to stop doing that. Now, most folks will say that we, we don't necessarily do that, but um, we do build new space on our existing roads. You're right, we don't build a lot of new roads anymore, but we do add a lot of capacity to the existing ones. And then also for the, the vehicle miles traveled that need to be on the road, making them as clean, clean, clean as possible. This can include all sorts of things. People who just realistically don't have any other choices for whatever reason, either personal circumstances, mobility limitations, um, all of those things, making those as, as clean as possible, as well as for transit vehicles and all those ones that are you know, carrying all those shared rides. Um, where, do, where do we need to go in the next several years? Um, the big one is that we really do need to align our state investments in the most recent 2020 executive supplemental budget. Uh, the number one, the transportation priorities, of which there are about five projects across the state, is 1.3 billion in new projects that induce demand and basically will effectively increase our VMT within three to five years. Um, that's just the recent priorities that came out from the governor's office. We need to stop doing that, realistically. It's actively working. Um, one of them is in the H, two of them are in the H1 corridor, and they're actively working against what I would say is the rail investment we're making. Um, we need to develop that implementation plan. What's the roadmap? We have a sense of the big picture policies, but what does that really mean on the ground? Um, we do need to continue to put more money into the lowest emitting modes, biking, pedestrian, um, pedestrians, transit. You know, realistically, like to buy a vehicle, an electric vehicle may take time and energy, but you can start walking more trips tomorrow. Every single one of us can. If you can't do work, try school. If you can't do school, try the grocery store. You know, we, we don't need everyone to switch. We need about 30% of people to switch 30% of their trips to make a real dent. Um, Having the state lead by example, um, they currently employees receive pay less for parking here than they do for their bus pass every month. Oh, that's another one. Um, and then electrifying our vehicles faster, which I think a lot of folks have talked about, is that we can really accelerate this process. And my last takeaway is, is that we really do need to confront the truth of the vehicle economy that we put our money towards pretty significantly. Um, just this past month in Massachusetts, they, Harvard um, Kennedy School analyzed how much goes towards this. And this is the road maintenance, this is you owning your cars, this is the safety cost, this is air pollution and hospitalizations, all of these things together, and it's $64 billion a year. Um, and they're, bi they're bigger than us in lane miles and percentage, but if you put this into Hawaii, if you extrapolate off of that, we're looking at 13 to $16 billion a year across our 9,700 lane miles and our 1.4 million people. And they also said that about 55% of, of that total is going to be coming out of public costs across all of our government agency decisions, which is about seven to nine billion dollars a year. So when we talk about how we don't have enough money to afford a bike lane, or we don't have the ability to build out our sidewalk network, I would say we do. We just aren't spending it on it, so thank you. I just wanted to mention that we do have a 16-person office here in Hawaii, just a couple blocks away. And our job is simply to oversee and provide stewardship for the $180 million, which sounds like nothing now, Katie, thanks, um, <laughs> of uh, federal highways funding that comes to Hawaii um, every year. Um, I'm the transportation planner for the office, so I think a lot about the planning. And the FAST Act is the current transportation act that's in place. And the FAST Act asks that the state and the metropolitan planning organizations here do their surface transportation planning with 10 factors in mind. We ask them to look at a lot and consider a lot. And certainly, we don't ask them just to look at how fast do cars go. Um, but I wanted to show you that specifically, factor number five asks states and MPOs to promote energy conservation. And so as a planner, with that in mind, I was I wanted to look at what are the most energy efficient modes of transportation. So this um, slide shows that. It's a British slide, so it's um, in metric. <laughs> but um, the slide shows, of course, that the most efficient modes are shown at the top, and they're in green and blue. That's like biking, walking, light rail, and bus. Those are the modes that take the least amount of energy to move one person, one kilometer in this case. And the least energy efficient modes are at the bottom in uh, red and brown. And so I wanted to see how do people get to work today in Hawaii. And so this is our mode share. I make the colors kind of the same. And you can see that our, our commute to work is very energy intensive. We use a lot of the brown modes and very few of the blue modes. 
and green notes. And it seems that a lot of the conversation, even that what we heard today, is about electric cars. And I'm a happy electric car owner, by the way. But over half of the trips that are on Oahu are under three miles. And as a transportation planner, those are short trips that we could easily convert to an energy efficient mode like transit, biking, or walking. And um, I schlep my, my kids all over the place in my electric car, but I also take them on the bus and I take them biking and walking. And I wanna know if we can make that easier for everybody to make that choice. Um, I wanna ask, is there a way that we can use less energy and not get, just convert the source of energy? So again, that's our MoChair today in Hawaii for uh, works to, journeys to work. Um, Kauai County has a bit of a greener MoChair. Congratulations, Ben, I was glad to see that. Mm -hmm. And that's our 2035 goal. Uh, here's the state of California looking at making less than half of its trips by driving um, in a car, either even by carpooling. They want less than half of those trips by car. And I wondered, can we? Why don't we aim for beating the state of California? Let's look at a mode show that's that's mostly green in the future. Um, just in that vein, I wanted to say that we, uh, I mentioned earlier that um, the state of Hawaii gets about $180 million via the federal highway system, and we have highways in our names, but we support a lot of all of the modes that we've been talking about today, including um, electric vehicle charging stations, infrastructure for public, for public purposes. We support transit infrastructure, biking and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, we support the studies that would look at transportation demand management, or TDM. So, um, when we ask whether there's a evolution or a revolution, I want to say that there's a great time to be talking about that right now because uh, Hawaii DOT is starting its um, statewide transportation plan literally like right now. And um, it's going to update that plan that sets a lot of policies for the state transportation system. And it's a great opportunity to take a data-driven approach and evaluate how our transportation options can truly contribute to those 25, 2045 energy goals. Um, please get involved, especially those of you here are, who are very concerned about a carbon neutral future. Hopefully that's all of us in the room. Talking about mode shifts um, from several presentations, not just including mine, but from several of my panelists. Um, I heard about the need for institutional change from HDOT, which I think is wonderful. They're not just thinking about uh, building more roads for cars to go faster, but how can they green their fleet? How can they work with others? Um, I think partnership is, uh, has obviously been a theme of the day, and I think the more that we can get out of our own silos, the better. Um, I heard about the hope for um, autonomous electric vehicles from the automobile deal dealers. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask first, um, let me see. It, I guess what I was surprised about was kind of, um, this, there was some divergence of opinion for sure, but we have the private sector, um, public sector, nonprofit sector here, and I heard a lot of commonalities. I am not sure the public is on board with these solutions that we've proposed. And I want to ask the panelists, do you perceive a difference between what the public thinks and what you all think? Um, if so, how do, how do we get the public on board with some solutions? And please feel, feel free to go. I'd like to speak to that if I could. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, the auto dealers are a client of mine, but I own an advertising agency. It's the second oldest ad agency in the town, and I've always felt that the public would get more on board if we communicated with them. In fact, we've asked, uh, Brian, since you have a $30 million budget, could we have 10% of that, $3 million of that, and we will advertise with an enormous advertising campaign talking about the benefits of making this transition. And then you would have all of Hawaii on board with understanding and having everybody on the same page. Three million dollars a year out of the thirty million dollar budget we requested that. That would change the whole world. Okay, communication. Um, I actually think that there is a really significant set of people that are on board with this, but that's not necessarily the way the process is structured about meeting those needs. Like the number one consideration or concern I think for a lot of people who live here is like the cost of living. And it's, I don't think it's totally visible to them how much this costs us all. And so some of that is education, but I think it's also actually responding to the fact that like we need to be doing things to make these lower emitting GHG and frankly more affordable options, like more convenient and more accessible to everybody. And then that's listening and that's meeting their needs. And that is, um, and continuing to talk about that. Um, 
a lot of times it's really about like, you know, I just, I'm sick of congestion. And, you know, basically if we remove one car, another one shows up. So it's really a challenge. We need to get people into new options. Like the road will always be filled and we need to find other options. So I think it's also just, not, it's not always about education. It's sometimes really listening to what people are challenging with and then trying to tailor our disciplines, sort of planning perspective towards that. Like how are we as agencies or, you know, people in this public policy space developing policies that help address those challenges explicitly within transportation and within energy. Ben, I can see. So just really quick, you know, it's an important question, but it is a communication question. It's, it's, it's not really the right question. We, we can't afford to continue to expand. It, it is flat out impossible. You know, when last time we did a state highway update on Kauai, we saw a 10x difference between what we need and what we can afford. So we're talking about a, an order of magnitude shortfall of money. So it's not an option. You know, we, we, what we need to communicate to people is, hey, we're gonna be stuck in traffic until we decide to get out of our cars. That's it. Yeah, for the DOT, you know, we realized, you know, we can't build out anymore and kind of touching on what Dave mentioned about uh, connecting autonomous vehicles, that's the direction we want to head. So, you know, on the three of the island, we've already um, upgraded all of our signals, getting ready for that. And, um, you know, with that, you know, be hopefully less vehicles on the road, make, um, we can have our traffic signals be a transit priority, uh, you know, make it safer for pedestrians. So, you know, that would encourage more walking, bicycling and so forth. Um, just to kind of hop on that train, no pun intended. Um, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, trans transportation joke. Um, I, I think it's kind of hard to ask the public, which obviously isn't a monolith either, what it what they want because that's something that people don't think about all the time i mean transportation is essentially a conduit to do what you want to do in your day-to-day -day life and live the life that you want to live um i think very similar to energy in that way um i what from what i hear and what i've heard over just the course of kind of working in this community is that people want to live a dignified life they want to have a healthy family they want their family to be safe they want to have you know to be able to live a life that you know they essentially want to live um, and, and have that freedom and flexibility. And I think it's really, I mean, it's definitely a collective decision, but it, it, you know, there's certain blind spots that people have that you know, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see if you didn't have kind of the viewpoint of, say, the state or, or the city. Um, probably not the best person to quote right now, but I did see a presentation by Carlos Ghosn <laughs> a few years ago. And um, he did make a good point. So maybe not on like um, tax accounting, but uh, related to, to automobiles, one of the things that he did say was that cars are less like a refrigerator and more like a puppy. And I, that always stuck with me because it made me realize how sticky cars were in that sense. You know, it's like you name your car, you spend a lot of time with it, you wash it, you know? And so I think when you ask, if, if the question is, is what does the public want, that's a really hard question to answer because it's like, yeah, of course the public wants a puppy. But if that puppy is gonna you know, lead to greater carbon emissions and lead to a lot of traffic and all these other things, it's kind of hard to um, really uh, make an individual evaluation of what's actually the biggest benefit for the public. I would refer to in the transportation sector as uh, travel to, uh, TDM, demand management, travel demand management. I heard energy management mentioned very freely in the um, energy panel that we just have. They talked about pricing to incentivize charging their cars at different times. Um, do you think there's any way we can make a demand management or pricing discussion part of the transportation discussion? The first thing we'd have to do is actually have the data about how people are moving around, which, which we really don't have right now. I mean, we, we have overall volumes, but we don't have specifics and time of day and all that kind of stuff in a real high resolution. I will agree with that. There's a reason why I put our journey to work data and not all chips, and that is because we don't know how all of our trips in the state work. So I would agree with that. I think data is a great um, a great puka here, and I would like to encourage you, Ben, to reach out to the statewide uh, planning office and ask them to address the data puka while they're doing their statewide plan. It's a good, good opportunity. Uh, I was really surprised. We got a call from the mainland. Uh, a group talked to us for an hour on a big conference call. We don't do fleets, but they talked about they had software that would allow uh, the fleets to be able to save massive amounts of money by not going going over the demand charge at some point. I'd never really realized till I looked up in our statues that we have demand charges. The good folks at the electric company can explain that more thoroughly, but wow, is that a complex piece of math. As much as I enjoy mathematics and did my mathematical proof of joy, I will tell you, 
uh, that demand charge concept is really complex. How you'd communicate to the public, I don't, I don't know. But yeah, they do it with software and fleets. But uh, that's a hard question and uh, hard to even explain. Okay. Uh, does anybody else want to talk about my pricing question, or should I move on? Um, I just wanted to highlight yeah. too. Oh, oh, one thing. So um, Hawaiian Electric Company and one of our companies, E-Motor Works, um, which was re recently acquired by NLX, they're actually doing a project right now. That was the one we talked to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're doing a project right now that's looking um, at how electric vehicle drivers and, and users kind of interact with the grid, and hopefully that can help inform some of the demand response efforts that the um, utility is, is creating in partnership with the Public Utilities Commission. And so I, I encourage you know those types of projects to continue to happen, and I think um, in the space that the Accelerator works in, there's a lot of technologies and companies that we see that are trying to figure out with you know the incorporation of data um, how to how people use both the grid or the road um, or parking lots and and price those in accordance with with demand with supply and demand Katie, do you want to take a stab and then i have one yeah. last question for the panel i will make it super fast because i know you want to move on to the question but i would say you know we always talk about it in terms of like increasing the price of things but we pay in other ways right now, and I think we sometimes forget that, is that like not being able to find a parking spot because it's priced improperly means that people sit around in queue for days, or like people sit in cars, put their cars in storage literally on public streets because there's no, you know, that's, it doesn't cost them anything to do that. And so we aren't really getting a sense of like what people are willing to pay or what's really important to them because it's all essentially not they're not paying for it as a direct user right now. And I think that's one of the things that we sort of forget is that if you price some of these things more accurately, they then may be available to people who really need them, like with mobility needs or people who, you know, have some other sites of challenges or, you know, just making some sort of way in which we all say that like waiting for something is not the right way to like evaluate its worth, but rather some sort of price mechanisms can help us get at some of those things a little bit more effectively. So and that there are real benefits to that. Um, that making some of those things managed more effectively means we may not have to spend as much on the entire supply associated with it. Um, you know, parking is a good example in the sense that most urban areas have, you know, 30, 40% more parking spaces than they need. And at $50,000 a pop to build them in a structure, like that's a lot of money. And we're just not managing well. So it's there. We're just not using it properly when we need to and under the right circumstances. And there's a lot of benefits to capturing that. So maybe if we can communicate that, use data skills and communication, bring out the real price of things, then start to understand the demand and shape that demand. Um, my last question, and we do need to wrap things up really quickly. So I'm going to go down the line. Uh, we are in the state capital. It's the beginning of the ledge. What's the one thing you would like the ledge to do this year, for your point of view? Uh, well, for us, of course, it's always money outside of our highway fund. That's always great. But I'm um, actually, you know, talking about the connected autonomous vehicles, you know, as we get forward, you know, and looking at our infrastructure, getting ready for that, you know, there's going to be a lot of legislation that's going to be changed or need to be changed to accommodate that. I don't know the exact needs right now, but, you know, it's things we're looking at. All right, Ben. So real quick, on the mode shift question, e-scooters, let's do that. Let's figure it out. On the electric vehicles question, I, I, you know, there was a question about 2025 and mandating that no one buy internal combustion engines. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think what we need to think is everyone's going to want to buy an electric vehicle in 2025, and so how do we get ready? So EV ready, uh, SB 1000 from last year is a great bill. Um, requires building owners in new construction to actually put in the infrastructure, both the conduits and the panel capacity to put in future EV charging. Much, much cheaper to do it that way than, than rich fit. <laughs> I think uh, I got a call the, this morning uh, asking if I could supply all the autonomous vehicle legislation from around the country to the Attorney General's office because uh, legislators were asking and wanting to put through connected autonomous vehicle legislation authorization this year. So that is a handful. Some of those bills are 54 pages long. Uh, some of these states have been added since 2011. Uh, the reason I've been pushing autonomous vehicles so much is because it becomes an answer to everything and the economy and all sorts of things. And my graphic was put up there to show that you'd have to sell everything past 2025 at electric vehicles, and there's just not the infrastructure available to park that in there to do it. That was my purpose of showing that, not to say that we ought to mandate that people go out and buy the cars. We, we can't do that. Okay. We have to find a way to get it done through. Let's give a chance. 
What's that? So let's pass the baton to Aki. We've got one minute left. Okay, double tap on what Ben said. And I'd like to kind of continue to lean into the initiatives that already exist. So Bike Share Hawaii, we should continue to support them even more than we are already now, um, both on the state and local level. And then I'd also love to see more funding go back into the state energy office because they have a pretty large kind of marching order right now that, ha that has a time fuse on it too. And so they need all the resources that they can get. Um, so, so please, please continue to fund and pr provide more funding into the state energy office. And Katie. Um, I would have to say is just starting to evaluate all of our infrastructure investments to moving more people and not vehicles. You want to validate your 13 Yes. Dollars. Yep. Okay. Yep. I want to know, like, I wanted to do that. And if, if that means giving the state energy office money to, like, really do that kind of stuff or hypothesize about it and reshift that funding, then so be it. 